go into all the world. Let us pray together. Our Father God, we pray that this hour you'll focus your attention here in this small room in the city of Los Angeles. That Heavenly Father, we believe that the hope of a lost world centers in the hearts of these people who will go out from this place after this conference into all the world to make disciples. Father, we believe that the world could be evangelized in our day. And so, Father, wherever we're at spiritually at this hour, I pray that this seminar changes us, that we make decisions to be the kind of disciples that impact the most people possible, Father. Father, thank you so much for everybody that's here. We pray your blessing on this lesson. It's the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Each of the four gospel evangelists record Jesus' global vision. In Matthew chapter 28. After his resurrection, Jesus says in verse 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It's clear right here that Matthew understood that Jesus wanted the disciples to go to all nations by making disciples and baptizing them. Amen? Turn to Mark chapter 16. In verse 15, Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Right here, Mark understood that Jesus wanted the disciples to go into all the world preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. Turn to John chapter 13. In verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. For John, it was clear. Jesus understood that the world, the entire world could know about his Father in heaven if the disciples would love one another. Another. But perhaps the most fascinating of all the gospel writers is Luke himself, who records the Great Commission in Acts chapter 1. This is shortly before Jesus ascends into the heavens. And Jesus says to the faithful 11 in verse 8, But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When I read that passage a few weeks ago, something struck me because at the same time I was reading through the Old Testament. In particular, I was focusing my energies on the book of Psalms. And so I started researching in the scriptures where Jesus shows the extent that we are to take the Gospels to the very ends of the earth. These words were not by chance at all. As a matter of fact, later on, Luke records something special about this phrase, to the ends of the earth. Turn to Acts chapter 13. This is the first missionary journey. They've come to Pisidian Antioch, and we begin reading in verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And that was a quote from the book of Isaiah. This phrase, to the ends of the earth, though unfamiliar to most of us Gentiles, 
would have been very familiar to the Jews that understood the word of God. As a matter of fact, the phrase is used 42 times in the Old Testament. Six times in the New Testament. And as I said, I was studying the book of Psalms and two particular passages stood out that I think really describe what Jesus meant when he says we are to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Go to Psalm 19. In verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the worlds. Right here, the psalmist just looks up to the heavens, and he sees God. He sees his power, his glory, his handiwork, and he hears his voice. And the Bible says right here, there's no speech or language where that voice is not heard. That voice goes out into all the earth, into all creation. When Jesus uses the phrase, to the ends of the earth, he means to the ends of the earth, the entire creation is to hear the word of God. Are you with me here, church? Yeah. Now, look at Psalm 61, verses 1 and 2. This one will move your heart. David says in verse 1, Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. All the other references to the ends of the earth are about God going to the ends of the earth. But right here, David says, hey, I'm at the ends of the earth. <laughs> you ever felt that way? Don't you want someone to get you the gospel if you're at the ends of the earth? I mean, what does it say about people who say that evangelizing the nations in this generation is impossible? It makes a statement not only about their faith, but about their heart. Because there are people at the end of the earth, at the end of their lives, begging for God voice to speak, and God is going to send a disciple if we but have that heart. Are you with me here, church? I think we need to understand and be clear. In Colossians chapter 1, in verse 6, the Spirit records that the gospel was bearing fruit all over the world. In verse 23, Paul himself says, this is the gospel that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. It seems clear that the gospel had gotten as Jesus had preached and prophesied to the ends of the earth. But you know something? History records that that was the only time it was done. Now, are we to say that God doesn't want the world evangelized in the 2nd century, the 12th century, the 18th century, the 21st century. God is the same God. So it's not that God's heart has changed. God's heart is that we take the gospel to the ends of the earth to answer the prayers of the people that are at the ends of the earth. So what is the variant? Why hasn't there been a group of people that have accomplished what the first century church did? I think it comes down to one word, leadership. The New Testament we look at the impact of the church, or dare we say, spiritual Israel. 
the Old Testament gives us a very up-close look at physical Israel, which may make it easier for us to see what we need to be in order to do and accomplish the will of God in this generation. Without question, the height of the glory of Israel, the time when the kingdom of Israel was heard all over the world, was during the reign of David. Go to First Chronicles chapter 11. We begin in verse 1. All Israel came together to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, even while Saul was king, you were the one who led Israel in their military campaigns. And the Lord your God said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to David to Hebron, he made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel, as the Lord had promised through Samuel. Right here, David becomes king, actually, of Judah. And it's seven years later that the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, join on in, and he becomes king of both Judah and Israel. But let's look at David's leadership. Verse verse 4. David and all the Israelites marched to Jerusalem, that is Jebus. The Jebusites who lived there said to David, you'll not get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. Don't you love that? You guys aren't going to get in here. Nevertheless. (laughs) David had said, whoever leads the attack on the Jebusites will become commander in chief. Joab, son of Zariah, went up first, and so he received the command. David then took up residence in the fortress, and so it was called the city of David. He built up the city around it from the supporting terraces to the surrounding wall, while Joab restored the rest of the city. And David became more and more powerful because the Lord Almighty was with him. These were the chiefs of David's mighty men. They, together with all Israel, gave his kingship strong support to extend it over the whole land, as the Lord had promised. This is the list of David's mighty men. Right here, we see... The ABCs of leadership. A, in verse 9, David was anchored in the Lord. That's where his strength came from. That's how he grew more and more powerful. Because the Lord Almighty was with him. B, he believed it could be done. In verse 5, When the Jebusites said, you will not get in here, the Holy Spirit records, nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion. In 1967, people said, you'll never be able to go on to the college campus and convert secular college students. Nevertheless, the Lord started the total commitment movement and hundreds of thousands of students were baptized. In 1979, people says, well, you can baptize all the college students that you want, but you'll never be able to build a church where adults and singles and campus and teens are totally committed. Nevertheless, the Lord started the Boston movement and churches that were filled with sold-out disciples. In 2006... The naysayer says, it is impossible to evangelize the nations in this generation. Nevertheless, the Lord initiated the sold-out discipling movement in Portland, Oregon, that believes and has the motivating vision to evangelize the nations in this generation. Are you with me right here? A. Anchored in the Lord, B, believe it can be done, and C, call others to leadership. Right here we see that David says, my leaders will be those that earn the right. Whoever leads the attack, they will be a leader. In our movement, we cannot give leadership away 
because of someone's charismatic personality or ways of working with people. There must be an earning the right to be a Bible talk leader. It is an honor in the Lord. We cannot give away an eldership to those that happen to be better businessmen. But we have got to have men that have earned the right in their life and their doctrine and their families in order to be elders. We cannot cheapen the grace of God by handing out evangelist pins to anybody that says, oh, I want to be in the ministry. That person has to earn the right by baptizing and raising others up to lead as Michael and Michelle have done at this hour. Amen, guys? Dave had called others to leadership. He was looking for mighty men. Let's look at the parallel passage in 2 Samuel chapter 23. We're familiar with the fact that early on, Saul pursued David. He pursued him to the point that David was left all alone in the cave of Adullam. And there in the cave of Adullam, with only the sword of Goliath to remind him that God was with him, there soon his family came. And the Bible says that men came from all over Israel, a special group of men, those that were in distress and in debt. And destitute. But when you hang around David, you hang around the Lord. And God changes you. These are some of the men that joined David when he was in the cave of Adullam. In verse 8 of chapter 23 of 2 Samuel. These are the names of David's mighty men. Joshua Bashabeth, a Takinamite. Now, his mom had a lot of different choices for names. <laughs> Joshua, Joshua Bashabeth, a Takinamite, was chief of the three. He raised a spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. Now, it would have been awesome if he had gotten 800 guys 800 times. But this dude took out 800 guys at one time. Now, that's a mighty man, amen? Yeah. Next to him was Eliezer, the son of Dodai, the Ahuite. As one of the three mighty men, he was with David. When they taunted the Philistines, gathered at Pastaman for battle. Then the men of Israel retreated, but he stood his ground and struck down the Philistine till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eliezer, but only to strip the dead. Right here, the Israelites are being routed. And the Bible says that Eliezer stands his ground. He refused to retreat. He refuses to give up his convictions that God will give him the victory. Now, the interesting thing. The scripture does enlighten us here in verse 9 that he was with David. And if you cross-reference this with the First Chronicles passage, you will find that it actually was Eleazar standing by David's side and not retreating. This was a loyal man. When I think of this kind of loyalty, I think of Chris Broom. Chris and Teresa came to that first jubilee in 2004. And when there all the naysayers and the grumblers were sitting there in the back with Lance Underhill... Chris and Teresa came up front. It was a hard time. Only Teresa noticed it, but she came up to me later and says, Kip, are, are you okay? I said, what do you mean? So she were literally shaking as you were praying and you're preaching. I mean, it, it, it was an incredible, challenging moment. That's right. 
but they understood. And there were spiritual influences, spiritual parents that drew the line against the vision to evangelize the nations in this generation. And while they retreated away from the confines of Portland, Chris and Teresa stood by our sides. And I believe that even tonight we see that God is giving us the victory. Are you with me here, church? <laughs> Verse 11. Next day, Moshama, son of Agi the Harite, when the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shama took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down. And the Lord brought about a great victory. God only works through men who have the courage to stand on their convictions. Don't think for a moment that we're the first group of people to dream to evangelize the nations in a generation. There have been men and women almost in every century who have had the dream, but who's had the courage to stand in the middle of the field with your back exposed? And to say, listen, I'm not retreating. God is with me, and God will give me the victory. Now, it's very interesting, this next passage. It says, during the harvest time, three of the 30 chief men came down to David at the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped at the valley of Rephraim. You know, I never got it. The three guys are the three guys they just mentioned. It's Joshua, Bashabeth, Eliezer, and Shammah. And the Bible says in verse 14, At that time David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty men broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, O Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? And David wouldn't drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty men. He says, this is the only one we recorded. He says, this was going on every day. This is how they lived their lives. That's the kind of loyalty that we've got to have. We have got to have our primary loyalty to Jesus Christ. And yes, we must be willing to die for Jesus. But I say to you, if you're only willing to die for Jesus, that'll never evangelize the world. You must be willing to die for your brother. When the world sees that kind of commitment, then and only then will it be stopped in its tracks. Most Americans fear the Muslims. They look upon them as fanatics who would strap bombs around themselves and kill other people, and certainly there is a twisted satanicness in their religion. And yet it scares us Because we are not as fanatic about Jesus Christ. We are afraid to lay down our lives for Jesus, let alone for our brothers. Is it not, therefore, unsurprising that the fastest growing faith in the world is the Muslim faith? People are in awe of that commitment. Satanic as it may be. But if we are to overcome and, yes, convert Muslim people. Because we are willing to die for God and for each other. Then we will conquer the land of the Muslims. You know, it's, it's interesting the other mighty men that are, that are shared about here. In verse 18, Abishai, the brother of Joab, son of Zariah, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 300 men whom he killed, and so he became as famous as the three. Was he not held in greater honor than the three? 
He became their commander, even though he wasn't included among them. He was an awesome guy. He just wasn't as awesome to be in the three. Amen? <laughs> Benaniah. Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, was a valiant fighter from Kabzil who performed great exploits. He struck down two of Moab's best men. He also went down to a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion and struck down a huge Egyptian. Although this Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaniah went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benaniah, son of Jehoiada. He too was as famous as the three mighty men. He was held in greater honor than any of the 30, but he was not included among the three. And David put him in charge of his bodyguards. I mean, that's like the WWF wrestler, The Rock, amen? <laughs> Say, dude, you're my bodyguard. I mean, what, what, what an incredible guy. I mean, the Bible, first of all, he strikes down two of Moab's best men. For fun, he says, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to have a, just a kind of a fun day off right here. I'm going to jump down into this snowy pit and go after this lion. You know, he wasn't looking for a draw right there. A victory was the only way out. <laughs> and then this Egyptian guy comes at him with this spear. And of course, spears are fairly long. And Benaniah only has a club. Well, he drops his club, makes a quick maneuver with the spear, takes the spear around, and shish kebabs the guy back. <laughs> now that is worthy to be your bodyguard. Amen, guys? <laughs> Now, I want to encourage all of you guys right here. It says that he was a valiant fighter from Kabzeel. Say, where is Kabzeel? That's exactly the point. It's kind of like DJ. Grew up in Hanover, Ohio. 800 people. His grandpa was the mayor. See? doesn't matter where you're from. When the Lord Almighty is with you, you can become a mighty man or a mighty woman of God. Amen, guys? And then to finish out this text, it says in verse 24, among the 30 mighty men, and he goes down a list, and he concludes in verse 39, and Uriah the Hittite. There were 37 in all. Wow. One of the mighty men was Uriah the Hittite. And we remember David's fall when he took Uriah's wife Bathsheba and committed adultery with her and then manipulated the troops so that Uriah would be murdered. But look at verse 34 in the second part. It says, Iliam, son of Ahithophel, the Gilanite. This one slides by us a little bit. But if you look at 2 Samuel chapter 11, you'll find that Bathsheba's dad is Iliam. He was a mighty man of David. And her grandpa was Ahithophel, the counselor above all counselors. David believed that this man, when he gave him counsel, spoke the very words of God. And yet, when there was Absalom's rebellion against David... Ahithophel changed sides, absolutely because of the bitterness he kept within, because his granddaughter was taken advantage of by David. And then Ahithophel commits suicide. And that's what happens spiritually any time you keep the bitterness in. As we said in the early days of Portland, bitterness is understandable but totally unacceptable. It is spiritual suicide. Yes, David fell, but he was a man after God's own heart because he repented. It seems that many of God's men fall. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 1. Here we record... David's lament for the death of Saul and Jonathan. And of course, the Bible's quite clear that Saul lost the battle. He lost the kingship because he departed from the Lord and he refused to repent. And of course, Jonathan 
was a best friend to David. But look what David writes about him. In verse 19, this is after they die. Your glory, O Israel, lies slain on your heights. How the mighty have fallen. Verse 23. Saul and Jonathan in life were loved and gracious. And in death, they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You are very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. How the mighty have fallen. The weapons of war have perished. I believe there's much to be taught to all of us in this passage. David understood that Saul's wickedness had taken him away from God because Saul had pursued David. And yet David did not grow embittered by Saul's sins. As a matter of fact, when he died, he fully understood that Saul had departed from the Lord. But there was a godly view of the good that he had done in his life. And though Jonathan never pursued David to kill him, remember that Jonathan never joined David either. His neutrality led to his own death. And yet, David lamented the closeness and the uniqueness and the awesomeness of that relationship and that friendship with Jonathan when he said, your love for me was more wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. You know, we spring out, certainly of the Protestant churches, but in particular the Restoration Movement churches of the mainline churches of Christ and later the International Churches of Christ. And I put before you that many of us have a bitterness inside of us that'll destroy us. Now, David was absolutely firm about the evil and the wrong that was there. But there was an honoring of the good that was done. In the 1950s, the mainline Churches of Christ were the fastest growing group in America. However, by 1980, the average mainline church in America had 150 in attendance and only eight baptisms a year. Six of them were children of the members. And those that were baptized out of the world, less than 10% stayed faithful. There was no growth during the 70s and early 80s. As a matter of fact, I still receive the the Christian Chronicle, which is the the main publication of the mainline churches of Christ. And sad to say, in this most recent issue in February, it says, the church in America is marked by decline. The church in America, and it's talking about the churches of Christ here, is shrinking. The number of men, women, and children in the pews has dipped to its lowest level since a comprehensive effort to count members began in 1980, according to the 2009 edition of Churches of Christ in the United States. Those figures represent 526 fewer churches and 78,436 fewer people in the pews than just six years ago. The mainline church is dying. Now, that's not to say there might be a few that that have a lot of baptisms, but it's not a movement. It's not going to change the world. In the late 80s and the 1990s, the International Churches of Christ were the fastest growing Christian movement, not only in America, but the entire world. And yet, here... On Wikipedia, which they've written this article, are their convictions and their statistics. It says, the International Church of Christ is a body of autonomous, at least they own it right here, 
is a body of autonomous, non-denominational, religiously conservative, culturally innovative, socially engaging, and racially integrated Christian congregations, an offshoot of the mainline Churches of Christ. Sometimes called the Boston Movement because of its early ties to the Boston Church of Christ, it is controversial and a restorationist church which branched from the mainline Churches of Christ in the late 80s under the leadership of Kit McKean. The ICOC regards the New Testament of the Bible as the supreme authority on doctrine, ecclesiastical structure, and moral beliefs, while acknowledging the historical accuracy and divine inspiration of the non-binding Old Testament. This was written by their leaders. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul is writing Timothy, and he says in verse 14, But as for you, continue in what you've learned, and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which were able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And here's the scripture we all know. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Right here, Paul talks about Timothy's young days being raised by a Jewish mom who later becomes a Christian. The word scripture in the New Testament always refers to the Old Testament because the New Testament hadn't been canonized yet. Yes, the apostles' teachings where they were in conflict with the Old Testament, particularly the Mosaic Law, superseded them. But the Bible says quite clearly, Paul's talking to Timothy here in about 66 AD. He says, all scripture, talking about the Old Testament, is God-breathed, inspired, and is useful. It's to be applied for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is diametrically opposed to what the ICOC believes. They believe in the, quote, divine inspiration of the historical accuracy of the Old Testament, but they do not believe it is binding in any way upon it. That is absolutely different than what the New Testament teaches right here. And we need to be warned. We need to be warned that this is a false teaching from false teachers who want to take away your faith, and your convictions about the Word of God. Their stats, recorded here in 2005, they say that there are 543 congregations with 95,000 members. Well, that's still a loss of 40,000 people in three years' time. Now, these stats are totally off. They include churches such as the ones that used to be known, such as the San Francisco International Church of Christ, which has now become the Bay Area Christian Church, which has totally disassociated itself from the ICOC. And if you ask an ICOC person, do you have a sister church in San Francisco? Well, yes and no. They didn't sign the unity letter. But they have... No zeal to say, hold, we got to plant a new church in San Francisco so all of San Francisco can, A, have a chance to know the gospel, and B, be a part of a fellowship where you can walk into that church and be greeted by loving and accepting brothers and sisters. Are you with me here? (laughs) The more accurate statistics are most likely that the ICOC is less than half of what it was in 2001. It's probably about 60,000 members. That's it. Now, some people are taken aback. They say, well, this one church is having a lot of baptisms. You know something? Amen for that. That's a couple more people we don't have to get and evangelize. Now, they're not going to be part of a movement, and, well, amen, that's why we're going to talk to them after they're baptized. But some of, some of your faith is very fragile in what we're doing. 
This is not a movement of men. This is a movement of God. It's God's only hope to evangelize the nations in this generation. It's not been done since the first century. Can it be done? Absolutely, because God is with us. Are you with me here, church? I have five quick challenges for us. Number one, mighty men rise to mighty challenges. You know, right here, I have to lift up our three mighty men. First of all, I'm going to start with Mike Patterson. Mike moved to Portland after we were just going for a couple of years. And he came there, though he was a leader in Wichita, where he came from. He came to Portland and had absolutely no leadership. Why? He needed to earn the right. He was very effective in speaking. But he had to earn the right to lead. He quickly did that and became a Bible talk leader. He wanted to become the caps minister, but he was passed over for that and became the youth minister. But it was at that time that Matt Sullivan invited him to go down to Phoenix and become the campus minister down there. Now, when he went to Phoenix in January 2008, there were but six students When he left just a couple of weeks ago, just a year and a half later, there were 35 students. Amen? What's your excuse? Our second mighty man is Andrew Smelly. He didn't have six students when he started the campus ministry at Howard University. He had none. So what did he do? He baptized one. A guy named Kofi. He was a seminarian going to the divinity school there at Howard University. And it's awesome. Get this. Since the beginning of March, that one student has multiplied to nine students. What's your excuse? Mighty men rise to mighty challenges. Is it any wonder then when Chris and Teresa and myself sat down with the smellies there at the Northeast Evangelism Seminar in Syracuse, and I said, bro, you have done an incredible job there in D.C., but I still feel like there are some things you need to work on. And if you're going to be part of the central leadership, I want you to come to L.A. and walk with me for a year and a half. And then we want to send a powerful mission team to Johannesburg, South Africa in 2011. When Andrew heard it, he just was, this is awesome. I said, here's what we want you to do. Essentially speaking, we want you to become the world sector leader for Africa. (laughs) Now, Africa... According to Andrew, he quickly researched this. Africa's got 54 countries, 922 million lost souls. Now, that's the work of a lifetime. But you know something? When Andrew was getting fired up, Patrick was sitting right next to him, just flooding down the tears. Because she was feeling, I'm going to be ripped out of the church that I just gave birth to, of all the sisters I love, all the sisters I'm working with. And after a couple of days, she understood the greater need and is 100% behind the decision, believing not only is God calling Andrew to Johannesburg, but God is calling her to Johannesburg. But also I had to explain to her, one of the things that messed us up in the old movement was the fact that we began many of our churches as autonomous churches. The Boston movement began in planting autonomous churches, and it took us years to try to forge into a movement where we would share our resources of people and money. 
And so when everybody tanks spiritually, naturally, they're going to go back to their roots, which is autonomy. And so in the new movement, we're going to do it like the scriptures. And in the scriptures, Paul would send in an evangelist to straighten out a church. And an autonomous church is doomed the moment their evangelist starts going down the tubes. Because the evangelist and his wife and their preaching is the spiritual ceiling of that church. They do poorly spiritually and there's no authority to deal with them in a strong but loving way. That church will begin to drift away from sound doctrine and from sound life. Are you with me right here, church? And so there had to be a little teaching here with Patrick. Say, say, sis, it's not your church. It's God's church. And now we want you to come in so we can send you back out. And we need to understand, that's how it's going to be in all the churches. Yes, even the evangelist has got to be able to go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything. Are you with me here, church? Another mighty man is Chris Adams in Syracuse. You know, this is a brother. This, that church in Syracuse has given up two mission teams, tons of money, and consequently hasn't been near as fruitful as it was under the leadership of Chris and Andrew. And, and sometimes we can become very worldly and not understand the hit that sending out mission teams has to the mother church. And sadly, it, it, it started to get to Chris and carry through a little bit. And so... The Lord sent me over there to the seminar, and we laid out from Revelations chapter 2 that you don't lose your first love. The Bible says you forsake it. And you got to repent from the height from which you've fallen. I appreciate Chris. He got right up there, and he made a public apology. And in the last three weeks, the Lord has thrown open the floodgates of heaven the drought in Syracuse sober, though they only had one baptism between January 1 and July 12th. In the last three weeks, they've had five baptisms. And the last baptism was their daughter, Liza. Is that awesome or not? So not only is Chris a mighty evangelist, now he's qualified to be a mighty elder. Amen, guys? What we see right here is that mighty men rise to mighty challenges. Your situation can turn as quickly as you will repent of your faith. There need to be decisions tonight to repent of the drought that's going on in your Bible talk. There needs to be decisions tonight to repent the drought that is going on in your own life. When was the last time you brought some of the church and they got baptized? Tonight needs to be a decision that God is calling every single person in this room to become a Bible talk leader. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe that God is also calling many of you in this room to be a mission team member. To be a deacon, an elder, full time with Mercy Worldwide, or even an evangelist or women's ministry leader. A mighty man rises to mighty challenges. Point two. Mighty men inspire mighty faith. You know, David was an inspirational leader. He took out Goliath. He led Saul's armies in their campaigns. They were always victorious. No wonder when he was all alone, those that were in debt and distressed and destitute came to be with David. And being around David and his faith turned them into mighty men. Now, the awesome thing right here, as we noted before in verse 17, after the three had gotten David the water, it just says, such were the exploits of David's mighty men. You know, I I really appreciate that mighty man, Kyle Bartholomew. Not only did Kyle and Joan sell their house in order to put themselves into a full-time training mode here in L.A., 
But when we sent them back, we sent them back with the good intentions to give them a strong mission team of 10, but it turned out to be just six disciples. Wow, that can hit your heart. What's happened this first year with those six disciples? It's incredible. Kyle and Joan haven't felt sorry for themselves. Why? Those six disciples have had 22 baptisms and nine restorations. Is that awesome or not? I think about DJ and Casey Commisford. They had a mission team of 20, and it's not quite been 11 months, and they've seen 30 people baptized into Christ. They have a membership of 50. That's 150% growth. That's staggering. That's incredible. Not only that, but they live in a shabby place. They moved out of that particular one. It's a little bit less shabby, but it's still shabby. Why? Because they love the Lord. Not only that, but even though they weren't paying expenses... They still agreed to support Santiago, Chile for $600 a month. And when the money was running out, and DJ's faith was running a little bit low too, that's usually the time that I get a phone call. Bro, what do I need to do? I think maybe Casey needs to go to work. I said, no, bro. No, 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 no. 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 We do not retreat. We stand our ground. And so I challenged him. I said, if you have the faith, brother, you be like Hezekiah. And you take your financials before the Lord in the temple of God. And you tell your church, these are the financials. And right now you're going to run out of money in a matter of weeks. Unless the Lord answers your prayer for the church to make up and sacrifice what they need. Challenge the church to give 50% more. Do you have that faith, DJ? Yes, I do. I said, then do it. And he did it. And now the giving in New York has jumped from 1600 a week to almost 2500 a week. And they're paying their bills. Amen, church? Mighty men inspire mighty faith, but sometimes it's the mighty women in our lives. And if you're blessed by the grace of God, you have a disciple mom. You know, we we shared today as we were saying goodbye to Mike Underhill, just what a tremendous young man he is. And Lance and Connie have done a fabulous job in raising him. But many people don't realize that that Connie had him and became a single mom and was all alone. Later on, Lance came into the, their life and they be, became Christians. But this is the hardship level that Connie comes from. And she said in the sharing at our staff meeting to say goodbye to Michael, she says, son, I, I just want you to remember that every night I prayed with you to become an evangelist. And she started crying, and so did Michael. See, mighty women inspire mighty faith, because I'm sure that Mike Underhill is destined to become a mighty evangelist in New York City. Amen, guys? (laughs) Mighty men inspire mighty faith. I think of Ken and Liliana Zindler, who gave up their retirement in Florida, and moved all the way to California. What was powerful and inspirational? Well, he called doggedly his friend, Jim Fenton. And he says, brother, you need to come and see the new movement. Of course, they shared today, they went up to Washington, D.C., and they were moved. Then they came out to Los Angeles, and they were called to move here so that they could be restored. Now, they were still going to church on Sundays. But just because you go to church on Sundays doesn't mean that you're walking with the Lord or you're a faithful, sold-out disciple. They realized they needed to be restored. And so they've been in Bible studies, and praise God, it was exciting to see Jim and Donna restored today. Amen? 
But what they had to do, once they decided, Jim said, listen, I'm giving up my job in North Carolina. He told his boss, I'm moving to California. I've got to resign my job. And the boss says, hold it. I think we have a position for you in California. And he has that job right now. But you see, you've got to be willing to let everything go and push all the chips in and say, I'm all in. Are you with me here? Thirdly, mighty men convert mighty men. In the book of Acts, and we don't have enough time to go through each of the passages, but I think that we can get a glimpse. We find that in the book of Acts, that largely it was the conversion of the opinion leaders that's noted by the Holy Spirit. Very often right now in our conversation, we say, oh man, I want to be abundantly fruitful, John 15, 8. That's a very godly goal. And we think of being abundantly fruitful as just being able to baptize a lot of people. But really, the way to baptize a lot of people is to baptize an opinion leader who can work side by side with you and also be baptizing. And so the multiplication effect takes place. When you look at the book of Acts, it's, it's quite obvious the kind of people that they preach to. In chapter 4, we see that Peter preached to the Sanhedrin. I mean, this is the intellectual elite of all of Israel. We find at the end of chapter 4 that Joseph, a, Cyprus, a Levite from Cyprus, becomes a disciple. They call him Barnabas, and he sells a field. I mean, these are the kind of people that are getting converted, people that own land. You know, many of our churches, we're not converting people that still own their homes and own their lands. And so they can't have a way to give their homes and give their lands to the work of the Lord. Chapter 5, say what you will about Ananias and Sapphira, but they gave their home up. Of course, they lied about how much they were giving, but amen, that's a different story. (laughs) We see right here in chapter 8, the conversion of Simon the sorcerer and all the people that followed him. Also in chapter 8 is the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, we always call him the Ethiopian eunuch, but he's really the secretary of the treasury of all of Ethiopia. That's incredible. What an influence he would have been. And then, of course, there was the young zealot Saul in chapter 9. We find, of course, as the scriptures go on, all of the people that were impacted in the missionary journeys of Paul. We find, of course, him picking up Timothy there in Derby and Lystra. We also see the conversion of Lydia in chapter 16. In chapter 17, we read this in verse 3 about the conversion in Thessalonica. It says, This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. Then in Berea, in verse 12, it says, Many of the Jews believed, as also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. In Athens, it says in verse 34, a few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, and a woman named Demarius, and a number of others. These were the people that Paul converted. If you're wondering why your ministry is not multiplying, maybe it's because you're not converting someone like you. You know, it's really exciting Just a couple of weeks ago, we had an incredible couple baptized into Christ, Terrence and Kristen Ray, or Gray, excuse me. And it was awesome because they were met by Damon and Vicki James at the Martin Luther King Jr. parade. And they're both African-American couples. And if you look at Terrence and you look at Damien, there, there is a little bit of resemblance right there. And Damon got on up, and he was just so fired up. He says, I have been praying to convert someone just like me. Now, that could be a scary prayer for some of you guys. But the truth be told, we're often intimidated by the kind of people that have the talent level we have, and so we have a tendency to evangelize down. 
Now, we need to evangelize everybody, but if we're going to evangelize the world, we have got to evangelize the opinion leaders. Are you with me right here? You know, two of the campus ministries that Elena and I led uh, were largely propelled by being able to evangelize opinion leaders. When I was 21, I went to the University of Eastern Illinois to start a campus ministry there. We had seven mainline Church of Christ kids. In three years' time, 300 students were baptized into Christ. In one dorm, we had 45 Christians. Carmen Hall. What's it take? I remember telling that story to Mike Patterson. Bro, how did you do that? He says, basically, you do this. Here's your schedule. You show up on campus at noon, and you leave at midnight. That's what Mike Patterson did at Arizona State. That's what we did there at Charleston. I believe anybody that wants to be a mighty man of God can convert mighty men if you will work hard enough. Amen? Fourth point, mighty men mightily risk desk for life. That's exactly what the mighty men did for David in getting that water. You know, it was awesome on our recent trip to London and Moscow and Chennai, India. Because in Chennai, I was able to be taken by Raja to the place where the apostle Thomas was martyred. And my real name isn't Kip, but my real name is Thomas. And so to be able to go see my namesake, I said, that is awesome. But it's very sobering to think, here is a man that traveled all the way from Jerusalem, all the way down to the southern part of India, preached the word from 52 AD to about 72 AD, and then died for the cause, and to see the impact that he had. Now, the impact was not just in that day, but India, for the most part, is a Hindu nation. But in southern India, it's 25% quote-unquote Christian. And the disciples there will be the first to tell you that the easiest people to become disciples are not the Hindus, like Raja was, but it's the people that are pseudo-Christians. And so to this day, Thomas is yielding a harvest for his work. But when I think about people that have risked their lives for the cause, I think of our brother Tim Kernan. I mean... Tim, Tim will be the first to tell you he's sometimes even afraid to fly. But not only has he spearheaded an incredible remnant group there in London by calling people to be sold out disciples, but he has been a beacon of light through his own writings and preaching and teaching to the nations in Africa. And right now, we have four remnant groups in Africa, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Kenya, and in Ethiopia, and in next week in Johannesburg, South Africa, because Tim was willing to risk his life. On his very first trip, he went to the Democratic Republic of Congo, and for some reason, they perceived that he was a foreigner. (laughs) They beat him. They robbed him. The disciples took him on in and healed him. But he was willing to even go back and minister to those disciples. Mighty men, mightily risk death for life. Point five, a mighty plan for a mightier movement. Take these points down. Number one, I'm calling on every evangelist to public rededicate yourself to making disciples and world missions when you go back to your home congregation. Number two, I'm challenging every leader to preach and teach without compromise or politics that the word of God is the standard. It is the ideal, and the ideal is the standard in all of our churches. Number three, we need to provide inspiration and instruction to raise up new Bible talk leaders, elders, deacons, and evangelists in every congregation. Number four, we need to prove and test the love for God of the rich brothers and sisters in our churches, and call them to sacrifice. This is a huge need. The Bible says in 1 Timothy to command the rich to be generous on all occasion. Number five, we need to persist in inviting the remnant to join us. Why? Because they can make a difference 
in this movement. Amen, guys? And number six, we need to persuade every member to come to next year's Jubilee. You know, it, it took a lot of prayer and a lot of sacrifice to get all of you to come. This was just a leadership conference. Now, yes, the college students were invited, but next year, everybody is invited for the Jubilee. I don't know about you, but if we had to even go home after tonight, it would have been worth the money. Amen, church? But now you've got to go back, and you've got to say, it is incredible to be at one of these conferences where the leadership of God's new movement comes together, and we can all draw strength from fellowship with one another. Now, you're being given a handout that I believe will encourage you. The front page is the five-year plan that we handed out last year and was written up last year. We talked about in 2008, the sending out of Honolulu, New York, and D.C. We got to see New York and D.C. sent out. This year we talked about a new hope, which now is mercy worldwide. Amen? In 2010, we talked about planting London and Miami, and in India, having a full-time couple to help lead India. Well, we already have that full-time couple in Raja and Debs. We're already ahead of schedule right here. Amen. In 2011, we want to go to Johannesburg and Mexico City, 2012 Paris, and 2013 Hong Kong. Now, we understand, as the scripture says, in his heart, a man plants his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Turn to the next page. We are releasing, so to speak, an addendum to the five-year plan that we're calling the Crown of Thorns Project. You see the world right here upside down because as disciples, we are going to turn the world upside down. The Crown of Thorn represents the fact that Jesus has died for everybody in the whole world. And when you look at the list of cities right here, they literally encircle the globe and become the hope of redemption for the entire lost world. Now, we need to understand the United States. We already have powerful churches in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and D.C. Without question, those are our most influential cities. Amen? And we've got incredible churches in Eugene and Hilo, Honolulu, Phoenix, and Portland, and Syracuse, and we're excited about the support role that they play. But here's the challenge that we have. We really believe in the next four to six years... All of these churches can be planted with sold-out disciples. Now, the names may change a little bit here because the Holy Spirit's the one in charge. Amen, guys? But without question, I believe that Mike Patterson can preach the word in Cairo, Egypt. The Rajans are already preaching the word there in India, and we got to choose which city's going to be our pillar church, either Chennai or Delhi. And as we talked about before, we're not going to be possessed of our churches, but there's going to be a day the Holy Spirit is going to call the Commonsfords away from New York, and right now, they're destined to become the world sector leaders for Asia and make their base either Hong Kong or Singapore. Amen? Amen. Johannesburg is the Smellies. London is the Williamsons next year, guys. Manila, the Bartholomews, they're custom-made. I mean, Kyle's this big American guy, and the Filipinos love basketball. And, of course, Joan is a Filipina. I mean, what better couple to send to Manila, amen? And we already have a remnant group there. Mexico City, the Gonzaleses, amen? Yeah. Moscow, we can get the Kostinkos strong in Lord, then go back and replant the church there, amen? Yeah. Paris, we got the Kernans. They already speak French. They're French-Canadian. When the Williamsons go to London, the Kernans will come here, they will train, and then they will take a team to Paris, France. The Sullivans are in Santiago. The Morenos, well, they may stop off in Miami, but it'd be great to have them in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And finally, we have the Willises here with us that are visiting, but we're praying that during this seminar, they're going to decide to move to Los Angeles, retrain, and then take a mission team to Sydney, Australia in two years. Would that fire you up or not? And finally, if we're going to be God's kingdom around the world, then we need mercy worldwide right there. And right now, we are praying that sometime next year, the Bordieres, through the support of all the churches, would go full-time in the Lord. Amen? 
every now and then someone asks me, Kip, do you ever get discouraged? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what discourages you? The pressure of little money. Even today, there was a call to give, and though perhaps the LA Church gave nine or ten thousand, the, the total came out to thirteen five. Now, a lot of people gave, and we appreciate the sacrifice, but no one stepped up. Fallaways. It kills me every time someone falls away. Sin. Sin, particularly in a leader's life, but it really hits it when it's in my own life. Where my children are at spiritually, that, that's just a knife that's there. Now, when you see Manny Gonzalez get baptized and deliver a seminar speech on the day he's baptized, that's pretty awesome. And believe it or not, and I'm not trying to be funny here, the last thing that discourages me is my age. I can be standing around a group with DJ and Rob or Burgundy or something like that, and, and we're all talking. I just kind of think I'm one of them. I mean, I feel like the same guy I, that, that they look like. But I was just in the restroom, you know, before the lesson, and someone goes, oh, Mr. McKean, so sorry. Shh. 55. It's tough. You know, you know, when I get out there for brothers basketball, I'm not looking for the W. I'm just looking to make it through the game. <laughs> but so I think to myself, I said, well, how, how long will the Lord give me? And I pray quite often, since my parents are in their 80s, that God will give me till I'm 80. But it's up to him. And that'll be my greatest sadness that I don't get to see the world evangelized in my day. I mean, Moses got to glimpse it. And without question, tonight is quite a glimpse. But we need to understand that discouragement will come. One of my heroes, Mahatma Gandhi, wrote, Whenever I'm discouraged... I always remember that throughout history, love and truth prevail. Dictators may rule. Oppressors may seem for a while invincible. But always love and truth prevail. Let us be the mighty men and mighty women of God who evangelize the nations in this generation. Thank you.